All right. Well, hello, good evening, and a very happy Tuesday to all of you. This is Mr. Ippolito, and today we are doing our uh, unit exam, YouTube live uh, unit exam review on the Manifest Destiny unit. So everybody who's watching live, I want to say thank you for joining us, and to everyone who's watching the recording, uh, you're going to get a lot out of this as well. Uh, but a special advantage to our live folks is you're going to be able to ask questions live, and of course, I already see uh, questions popping up in the chat. They were here even before, uh, even before I went live. There were already questions in the chat. So uh, thank you already to Audrey and Raiden uh, for those warm up questions. Hey, uh, by the way, if you could please uh, take a moment right now, if you are watching live, if you want to uh, just say a quick hello in the chat, let me know that you're here. And if your username is not your the name that I would recognize you by, then just go ahead and let me know who you are uh, and say hello in the chat. And I'm uh, happy to have all of you here. First of all, I will start off by saying uh, hello to Audrey. Thank you, Audrey Ginsburg, for being here. Raiden, hello to you. Uh, I see Neha just uh, popping up into the chat. So hello, Neha. And to the, at least we have 19 folks uh, that are already joining us. Edeline, there we go, starting to come in right now. Uh, there's a little bit of a delay. Uh, Nico and Richie, hello. Jalen, Vincent, Jenna, Amelie, Tahan, Ashley, uh, Preston, Joel, Diego, Emma. Thank you, Dylan, I see you as well. Uh, and so welcome to all of you, Amelie. Uh, hello uh, and welcome. And oh, Haley and Joel, thank you. Uh, both of the both of the Prees twins are on. We've got Gabby, hello, Gabby. Uh, hola, Gabby says, uh, and then Raiden, hello again. All right, um, let's go ahead and just jump right in and get things started. Before I actually, I'm gonna do a screen share, but before I do that, a couple things that I want to mention to you uh, so that you, because you're here either live or via recording, uh, just so you know this. First of all, all of the resources, let me do a quick screen share here. Before I do the other screen share, let me do this screen share first. Uh, and that would be to show you once again, of course, you've been in Google Classroom plenty of times, but over the past couple of days, in the past 48 hours, I have been sharing a number of different resources. So it, it says period one right here, but of course this applies to all of my class periods. If you click study guide, I have been adding more and more and more resources. So first of all, just some information right here for you to be aware of kind of the typical kind of rules that you are aware of now, but if you're brand new to my class, maybe just joining us this semester within the past few weeks, uh, this is good to look over. Uh, then I also want to point you in the direction of these resources here. So we have the study guide, right? We have a map uh, that I think might be helpful to you uh, in your study and maybe even while you're taking the exam. We have the Gold Rush Missions, Mormons and Women, that uh, annotated handout right there, that PDF, that if you haven't had a chance to take a look at that, this was what I used. This annotated version was what I used uh, when I was creating the video for Gold Rush Missions, Mormons and Women. Uh, and so some really good stuff in here. Uh, either check this out or watch the video or both. Um, I have, this is our link, of course, to what we're watching right now. We have the animated atlas right here, that video. The guy, the narrator is a little monotone, but it, he does a really good job in just five minutes of really kind of talking about all of the westward expansion and, and does it in a very, uh, I think, easy to understand graphical format. Uh, if you want to play a little book it, this is, these are the vocab terms and kind of other terms, I think a total of 25, 26 different terms that you can practice with on book it. Uh, my Mr. Apolito explains vocabulary video. So all of that vocab, I'm really hoping to not talk about any vocab tonight, just because this has all of it. And uh, I think I may have already shown you, but it has, it even has the chapters, right? So if you don't want to watch all of it, you just take a look at the part that you need. There's Manifest Destiny, Seed, Siege, 49th Parallel, and so on. So really uh, not trying to spend too much time tonight on vocab, because I think all of the vocab I put into that video there. Two Manifest Destiny Wars, I think I promised somebody, I want to say it was in my period five class. Uh, I think I promised you that I would provide this for you. So I did. These are all of the answers. We really. Um, I think we went over this in all of my classes, but in some classes it was a little bit faster than others. So this is just all of the answers to that right there. Uh, and then finally, the last thing, these are the annotated notes that were that I'm gonna be sharing with you tonight. Some of it, some of these I've already filled out. You can see some other blanks there. Um, but as I take notes tonight, 
it will, by the end of the night, this will update this annotated study guide along with, I even have a map down here as well. Uh, so some other helpful information that, like I said, once the night is over, this will sync up I, that is on my iPad right now. And so anything that I write down or anything that I draw on the map uh, will sync up here. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and I am now going to go in the order in which I see the questions on the, uh, on the live chat. And uh, thank you, first of all, for everybody, uh, to everybody for checking in. And uh, I'll just give a quick shout out as well to those people I haven't yet. Uh, Sophia and Jahan, Tyler C., uh, and Colin Lefferts. And so thank you. And I'm just going to try to go in order. And um, so I'm starting at the very top, starting with Audrey. And let me do my screen share here. I'm a little out of practice. It's I don't think I've done this since December. So i uh, going to get my uh, start my iPad going here. And there we are. And I will bring this over. And Give me just a moment here. We'll do a screen share. Okay. Okay. So now I believe that I am successfully sharing my iPad screen so that you have an opportunity to see my study guide. And I think in just a moment, I will just verify that and I will see that on my screen here so that hopefully I'm doing the right share. I think I am. All right. Perfect. There it is. I see it. And I see my face. And so I think we're all good. So uh, the first question Audrey asks is, please explain Oregon poll factors, Texas question three and Oregon country one. So Audrey, I'm going to go ahead and start with you. And I actually went ahead and preloaded those. So I think it's important for us when we're talking about Oregon country, I think it's important to acknowledge the three different groups, right? There are three different groups here uh, involved. There are, we have the missionaries. Those would be like specifically, we learned about Marcus and Narcissa Whitman. We're going to talk about them. The mountain men, I think we need to acknowledge them. And then finally, the families along the Oregon Trail, because each of them had different push and pull factors. So let's start off with the missionaries first. Uh, missionaries, I think wherever the, we, they are, we had this conversation in some of my classes about the Spanish missionaries going to the California mission, going to California and starting the California missions, right? If you're a missionary, your push factor, the reason, the thing that is pushing you away from your original home, I think first and foremost is a desire to fulfill God's will, right? According to your belief, you believe that God wants you to leave the place that you are because you look around and you're like, Okay, let's say if you're a Christian missionary, for example, okay, you're a Christian, you're a Christian, you're a Christian, you're a Christian, you are surrounded by a lot of Christians. And so you're like, okay, pretty much everybody around me is Christian, kind of believes what I believe. So I'm going to go to a different place and try to spread the word of God to those people over there living in that place, right? So I think for a missionary, missionaries like Marcus and Narcissa Whitman, or missionaries like the Spanish missionaries, right, who were settling in California and starting that chain of missions, the California missions. I think their push factor is they hear this calling from God, a religious calling to go elsewhere and spread your religion. Uh, if we're talking about push factors, um, and I know, I know you're saying, you, you said pull factors, Audrey, I'm going to talk about push and pull. Um, for the mountain men, I think the push factor for them was a lack of job opportunities, a lack of money, um, boredom. I think sometimes uh, what motivated, and I think what still maybe motivates some people to leave, especially if you are a young man, most of the mountain men were young men, I would say in their late teens, in their 20s, maybe early 30s, they're looking to go out and kind of find their own way in the world because they feel like they don't, wherever they're coming from, Ohio, Pennsylvania, um, Kentucky, Tennessee, whatever, they're maybe not finding their economic opportunity or finding their adventure where they are. And so that's their push factor to go out there. And then finally, I think the families on the Oregon Trail, you know, this push factor, I think, is the most difficult to understand. We've talked about this before. Most of the families on the Oregon Trail, they already had a home, right? They already have some money. They probably already have some farmland. So why would they leave? And I think maybe the push factor for them was just wanting a new start, a fresh start, a new adventure. Um, uh, maybe maybe they felt called by manifest destiny to go out to the west and and start a new life. Uh, maybe it's maybe there's some debt. And uh, you know today with credit cards and electronic uh, credit monitoring, there's really no way to escape your debt in 2022 if you owe a lot of money on credit cards or uh, student loans or whatever. But you know what? In the 1830s and 1840s, if you had a lot of debt, if you just moved far away, then it's possible that you could escape your debt. So 
I think those are the push factors for Oregon. Now, uh, Audrey, to your question about pull factors, again, we need to look at the three different groups, missionaries, mountain men, and families along the Oregon Trail. For the missionaries, I think that pull factor is easy, right? The pull factor for the missionaries is they are drawn to the Native Americans. I believe it was the Cayuse Indians, those Native Americans in uh, the Willamette Valley there in, in Oregon, in and around Oregon City, what will become Portland. Um, I think that's the pull factor is these Native Americans that have never known Christianity, right? They have their own religious beliefs and they are, that's the pull. Hey, those people could be converted to Christianity. I think for the mountain men, the pull is uh, the prospect of all the beavers that are in the Oregon region and being able to kill those beavers and tear their hides off and sell their fur, right? If we're being honest, that's what those mountain men wanted to do because there was a lot of money. People on the East Coast, um, these furriers, these people who are making fur coats and fur stoles and fur wraps and things um, for the wealthy of New York City, of Boston, of Philadelphia, for the wealthy of London and Paris, those beaver pelts were selling for a lot of money, right? So I think that is the pull factor is those beaver furs, pardon my um, quick uh, cursive writing there. And then finally, the families on the Oregon Trail, I think the biggest pull factor for them is going to be farmland, right? It's going to be that, like it is for a lot of families traveling out west, uh, we've got the bigger, you know, wider open spaces, the ability for a fresh start, uh, really good farmland, especially in Oregon. Uh, I think good farmland also in parts of California, some other parts of the west, that's a draw as well. So uh, Audrey, I hope that answers your question. And uh, Audrey, really quickly, I will answer Texas question number three. That is William B. Travis, right? If you remember from the movie, The Alamo, the commander of the Alamo forces was William B. Travis. And then finally, Oregon country question number one, going back up, which five states were carved out of Oregon country? I should pause for a moment and say some of you who have the earlier version of the study guide, it says six, and I apologize, it should be five. So those five states that were carved out of Oregon territory, I'm going to go ahead and scroll and show you on the map. These are the five states that are carved out of Oregon Territory. We have Washington, we have Oregon, we have part of Montana, right? This part right here. So part of Montana and Wyoming, and then finally all of Idaho. So those are the five states that are carved out of Oregon Territory. So Audrey, hopefully I answered all of those questions. And if you have more, then throw them in the chat. All right, Raiden, uh, getting to your question. Here are some questions I have. What are the map questions going to be like? So Raiden, the best thing that I can tell you is the map questions are going to be like the ones that we practiced in formative, right? So that that's it's going to be based on what you learned and it will be the very an identical format to what you had in formative. You might even see some repeat questions from the practice, um, but that's the best thing that I can tell you what the map questions are gonna be like. Uh, Oregon country number six. All right, so Raiden, if I'm going back up to Oregon country number six says, which four countries, if you hear a, a dog, uh, scratching. That's my dog, Bella, right there. Uh, so you might get a chance to meet Bella and she might scratch a little bit more. I might need to step away to let her outside. Um, <laughs> but we'll, we'll keep going for right now. Which four countries had claims to the land? Uh, we're talking about specifically the land of Oregon country in the 1800s. Those, um, those four countries, you see, I have them written down right here. Those four countries are Britain, Russia, Spain, and the United States. Each one of them had some sort of settlement, had some sort of outpost or a fort or something in Oregon territory in the, in, at least in the early 1800s. And of course, by the, the later 1800s, by uh, certainly by the 1820s and 1830s, kind of Russia and Spain's interests had kind of fallen away. And so really you're just left with, which is the answer to number seven, which two countries jointly occupied the land, Britain and, and the United States were the ones that really had the sole claim to Oregon territory. And while I have this map, I think it's probably worth noting that Oregon Territory extended all the way into what is British Columbia today. So Oregon Territory was really all of this, right? And then it was, it was in 1846 when the United States and Britain, who were almost ready to go to war over this, finally, uh, President James K. Polk thought, you know what, I probably should not fight two wars at the same time. So that was when we went ahead and drew that line, that line of demarcation between what will become Canada and uh, the United States, the boundary right there. And we drew it at the 49th parallel, right? So 49th parallel, I think that's a vocab term. And then that's also 
probably an answer to some other question somewhere in the study guide as well. So Raiden, I think I successfully answered Oregon country number six. Let's go ahead and you asked about Texas number 10. So we'll go to Texas number 10. Oh, I think I went too far. Let's go back to Texas number 10. Why do you think the Texans declared independence from Mexico in 1836? Do you believe their cause is, was a just cause and so on and so on? So I'm actually, Raiden, I'm not gonna answer this for you because this is kind of based on your opinion. Um, this is, you're gonna make a claim and then you're gonna back up that claim with evidence. So this is not really a question that I can answer. This is not like a fact-based question, um, but I will tell you this could potentially, you might see question number 10 as a short answer question on the exam. And I'm gonna tell you just like uh, some of these other questions here, this could be a short answer question, prepare to support uh, this, the answer to the question with historical evidence, right? So you're gonna make a claim and then you're gonna back it up with evidence. So, um, so that's all I can say about that. I will though, since we're talking about short answer questions, I will take a brief pause uh, to say this, when it comes to short answer, what I've decided to do is you know, originally we talked in class about the possibility closure Chromebook and you have to handwrite it. I will tell you, that for those of you, this is, uh, this is your reward for watching, whether it's live or recorded. Um, you can, I will let you know right now that all of this will be informative, right? So you will be typing your answer. You may type your answers to the short answer questions. You may use Google. You may use any digital resources that you need for the short answer questions as well. However, I will warn you, as I've warned in the past, and I'll warn again, you must use your own words. If you don't use your own words, you risk getting a zero, a score of zero on that particular short answer question because you need to, your answer needs to be your words and not somebody else's words. If you're going to quote from President James K. Polk, or you're going to quote from uh, John L. O. Sullivan, right, from the primary sources, you can absolutely do that. That's fine. You can quote a primary source. That's good. But if you are Googling an answer and your answer sounds remarkably similar to something that I can just easily Google, then you're going to get a zero on it. It has to be your own original thought, your own original response. Um, okay. And I think this is now a good opportunity for us. Uh, that was Texas number 10. Gold Rush, more missions, Mormons, and women. Raiden, I'm going to get now to that question there, number 10. Why could the California gold rush be described as meteoric? I will take a moment to talk about this. Uh, in the same way that we talked about the life and career of Tecumseh as meteoric, if you, if you recall that we, when we learned about Tecumseh, remember the Shawnee leader Tecumseh, we described Tecumseh, his career, his life as meteoric. In other words, Tecumseh burned very brightly. Uh, he made a big impact on American history but he lasted for a very short time, right? His career, his life, his life was uh, cut short in the War of 1812. So we can talk about Tecumseh as being meteoric. And I think in that same way, we can talk about the California gold rush as being meteoric, right? Burning very brightly, that's a metaphor, right? Burning very brightly, making a big impact, but only lasting a very short amount of time. So um, again, that's one of those that could potentially be a short answer question. So I'm not going to say too much more about that, but I think that kind of leads you down the right path, hopefully, uh, where you're thinking about how the California gold rush could be considered meteoric. Okay, Raiden, I believe that I have answered your question. And I'm going to just keep scrolling down in the chat. There's some great questions so far. Um, and so Ashley asks, can you go over number eight on gold rush missions, Mormons and women? Uh, number eight. Okay, so <laughs> where in California was gold discovered? Well, if we're being honest about where in California gold was discovered, we're talking about number eight. The first place gold was discovered was actually right here in Plaza Rita Canyon, just a few miles away from us at the Oak of the Golden Dream. Okay. Uh, and so that is the, that is the, where it was absolutely first discovered in California that we know of. However, the place where it was popularized, right, was at Sutter's, and again, pardon my quick writing here. I left my Apple Pencil in my classroom. Uh, this is at Sutter's Mill in Coloma, California. I've mentioned this a few different times. Coloma, California, that was the gold discovery by James Marshall. I will write James Marshall's name very quickly and kind of messy down here. James Marshall, there's two L's at the end of Marshall. James Marshall is the one who discovers... Um, 
uh, discovers gold at Sutter's Mill. And so that was the that was the very famous gold discovery in 1848. And then he's like, OK, let's not tell anybody. And then John Sutter, who was the owner of Sutter's Mill, that's what is named after. He's like, OK, yeah, we shouldn't tell anyone. Well, of course, by 1849, the word had gotten out. President Polk is mentioning it in his message to to uh, he he talked about it in a message to Congress like the word had gotten out. So it was it was out there. When I say President Polk, yeah, President Polk was still president. Uh, he was president until March of 1849. So uh, the word got out and it was like, th there was no containing it after that. So that uh, that's the answer to that. And by the way, I should tell you that uh, Gold Rush Missions, Mormons and Women, if you would like all of these answers, because I go over all of these answers, you can watch that YouTube video right there. Uh, and all of those answers are right there. And I go over them in a little bit more detail and not talking quite as quickly as I do uh, right here. So um, Ashley, hope that helps you. And then Amelie says, can you go over Texas number six, please? So we'll go back to Texas number six. Where did the Texans get their revenge? This is a great question. And the answer is San Jacinto. And again, pardon my messiness here. San Jacinto, it is the, the J makes the same sound in Jacinto as the J would make in the, in the word jalapeno, right? So San Jacinto in Texas, obviously. If you recall at the end of the movie, The Alamo, that was where you know the, all of the Mexican troops are running back to the river. And that's where they captured, uh, the Texan army captured Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana. They didn't kill him, right? Because... You know, everybody's like, oh, hang him, get a rope, let's kill him. And Sam Houston says, you want blood or you'll settle for blood, but I want Texas. So this was where the Texans got their revenge was at the Battle of San Jacinto. If you recall, uh, the battle lasted for only 18 minutes and Sam Houston proved that he was a brilliant tactician and that he was a really good general and he knew what he was doing the whole time even though there are a bunch of people who thought that he was uh, uh you know not very smart and that he wasn't a good general so anyway that's the question to number six and hopefully that helps you amelie uh neha asks for texas number one where why were americans moving to norte mexico and settling there so this really if we're talking about question number one now this uh kind of speaks to the push and pull factors of why people were moving to texas so I think push factors in uh, why people are moving to Texas, similar to maybe like the Oregon Trail, Oregon country, right? Some families were, they wanted a new start, a new life. They wanted some new opportunity. Maybe some of them wanted those wide open spaces or really good farmland. They wanted cheap land or they wanted free land, right? If you recall, again, going back to the movie, the one of the reasons why I love showing this movie is because it speaks so much to the push and pull factors of people going into Texas. Uh, at the big, towards the beginning of the film, Sam Houston, uh, when they're in the theater, right? He's, he, he goes up to Davy Crockett and he says, if you volunteer for militia duty, I will give you 640 acres of your own choosing. Now, 640 acres is a lot of land. It's a lot of land. I think that Rio Norte, I want to say, sits on about four or five acres of land. So imagine that's like four acres of land. And then imagine 640 acres of land. It is an enormous amount of land, right? And so, uh, so if you could get a ton, a ton of land, and it has as... Sam Houston, the character Sam Houston was saying in the movie, there's game, there's timber, there's cattle. So there's hunting, there is, there's fishing, there's, you know, there's land for, uh, you know, land for, there's farmland. It's so I think that is, that's the pull factor. We talked about the push, meaning people wanted some new opportunities. Maybe they did, they didn't like how little land they had. Uh, how little land that they owned in their old place. And they'd like to go out to a new place. The pull factors into Texas, more land, bigger land, cheap land, free land. Uh, and then perhaps they are feeling in their old place, wherever they're living, uh, that they, you know, they don't have as much freedom, maybe the freedom to, uh, you know, economic freedom or economic opportunity. And so that would be a push factor out of their old place, whether they're moving from out of Alabama, Mississippi, Arkansas, Missouri, Tennessee, wherever they're coming from, and they're being pulled for more land, uh, you know, better economic opportunity. I will also say that the pull factor, and this is when we get to Travis's speech, right? Again, going back to the movie, when William Travis says, Texas for me has been like an opportunity, a new opportunity, an opportunity to be a new man. Perhaps it will be for you as well. So we referred to this earlier. Perhaps there were some people who were in debt, right? Maybe they, they owed money to somebody or maybe they committed a crime. Maybe they killed a man 
or they did something else that they're not proud of, right? Again, moving today, your criminal record is going to travel with you. Your credit record is going to travel with you in the year 2022. But back in the year 1846, 18, or you know, in this case, 1835, 1836, moving hundreds of miles away meant that you really could get a fresh start, right? You really, it's, it's almost like you could hit that reset button and you could really start a new life uh, away from your past, away from the person that you used to be. Uh, and really, you could really truly get a fresh start. So uh, that was a great question, Neha. I'm glad you asked that. Uh, so that was uh, Neha asking about number one, and then Neha. Oh, and then Colin asks, "Can you do number ten? I'm assuming you mean Texas number ten, and uh, we've already talked about that. So we're going to move on to Neha asking about Texas number four. In what city is the Alamo? That is San Antonio, San Antonio, Texas. What was the Alamo used for over the years? Um, well, if you remember from the film, and we. I think this is in the book as well. It was used as a church and it was used as a fort, kind of as a sanctuary, um, as a lookout point. It was used at, like as all of these different things, um, but it was in San Antonio, Texas, San Antonio, which incidentally means St. Anthony in Spanish. Okay. Uh, got you, Neha. Got you, Colin. And then back to Neha. Jahan said, can you do push and pull factors for the Mormon trail, please? I absolutely can. Yeah. So let's talk about push and pull factors for the Mormon trail now. Well, the push factors for the Mormon trail, this is, fortunately, this is a little bit easier, right? Because the Mormons, as you recall, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, they were facing a lot of persecution, religious persecution. They were getting picked on uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormon church. Uh, they refer to themselves today as LDS. Uh, we have LDS family and friends uh, of my family. And uh, so anyway, the, the LDS Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, they were, uh, they were a relatively new form of Christianity, right? They were, it's almost like the original, like American religion, because other forms of Christianity, other um, uh, denominations of Christianity started in Europe, right? Uh, and before that in the, you know, kind of in the, in, in the Middle East, uh, in, in and around Israel, what is today Israel and Greece, kind of the, the earliest forms of Christianity formed there. And then other um, denominations of Christianity sprang, uh, sprang up during the Protestant Reformation and all of that. This is really the first American form of Christianity is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormon Church. Um, I think other Christians didn't like that. They didn't like their belief system. They didn't like the fact that there was an additional, they believed in kind of like an additional gospel, right? Or an additional Testament. And they called that additional Testament, the book of Mormon. And that's where you get the term, the Mormons from uh, the book of, excuse me, book of Mormon. And um, so they got, they got persecuted for their different belief system, their additional text that they, that they have, um, also for their practice of polygamy, the marrying of more than one wife. Uh, and I believe that was rooted in uh, really a desire to, as the Bible, uh, some part of the Bible, I'm not quite sure which one says, go forth and multiply. And so in their eyes, uh, they believed that the best way to do this is for a man to, you know, if you could have, I don't know, four or five, six, seven kids from one wife, well, then if you had two wives, then you can, you can go forth and multiply even more or three wives or four or more. So that led to religious persecution. Um, and so that was, they originally moved out of New York and then I think they moved to Ohio and then to Illinois. And then finally they're pushed out of Illinois. Their leader, Joseph Smith is murdered. And then finally their new leader, Brigham Young will then pull them, will take them uh, out of Illinois and lead them along the Mormon trail, right? And let me just go ahead. And since we're talking about the Mormons and the Mormon Trail, uh, will lead them from Nauvoo, Illinois, which is right about here, um, and lead them, let me get a different color marker here, and kind of lead them, and I apologize for the not perfect uh, map here, but will lead them into the Valley of the Great Salt Lake right there in what is today Utah, and again, the pull, because if you're out in the middle of the desert, because that's really where it was, it, it was a desert, it was not the lush gardens, the lush greenery of Oregon. It was not, you know, the, the central Valley or the, or the coast of California. This was the desert of uh, what will become Utah. Why would they go out to the desert? Well, again, a pull factor for the desert is wide open spaces, no neighbors, nobody else is going to come and bother you. So they really have an opportunity to form their own community and create a new life and just kind of be off by themselves. And so those are the push and pull factors for the Mormons, the, the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. 
Okay. Uh, and again, for all of these, I will just say one more time, for anything related to Gold Rush missions, Mormons, and women, let me just encourage you one more time to please, I encourage you to go to that YouTube video because uh, way more and I don't talk nearly as quickly in that YouTube video. Okay. Uh, Gabby is asking about Gold Rush number two. Describe how the Native Americans were treated at the missions. Uh, short answer, again, if you want more detail, watch that YouTube video. But the short answer is that they were mistreated, right? They were treated as virtually as enslaved labor. Um, of course, they were um, they were converted to Christianity. And I, I'm sure that there were some who took well to Christianity, um, but uh, there were a lot who were basically taken captive and were not allowed to leave. They, they were the labor that worked on the missions and it was forced labor and uh, I think mostly unpaid labor. And so that's how the Native Americans were treated at the missions. Uh, so Gabby, great question on that. Uh, Vincent says, can you go through the whole study guide? Thanks. Well, Vincent, I'm doing my best. Um, but there's no way we're going to get through it in an hour. We're already halfway done. So um, I would say just keep listening, keep tuning in, and I will do my best to answer as many of the questions as I can. Uh, however, I will say this, and Vincent, I'm glad you mentioned this because this is a good time to say this. Ultimately, the exam will be on like all the stuff that we've learned over the past five weeks, right? It's a unit exam and our manifest destiny unit is the entire, the last five weeks. So um, I will do the best I can, but ultimately everything that you've learned, all of the reading, the, the handouts, the, the, you know, the work that we have done over the past five weeks, it's really all fair game. Uh, so this is, this is just kind of that test of learning uh, to see, to kind of measure what have you learned over the last five weeks in Mr. Apolito's U.S. history class. Okay. Thank you, Vincent. Um, all right. So next I have uh, Ashley asking, were the California missions Christian or Catholic? Um, that is a great question. Uh, first of all, I do have uh, a couple of folks that are, I'm not quite sure who they are. And uh, I'm going to just go ahead and uh, just remove them because I'm not sure who they are. And so we're <laughs> just going to get rid of these folks. There we go. Okay. Uh, perfect. I think, yeah, because, because again, just, I'll just say this, this, uh, this particular, um, this particular YouTube live is for the purposes of my history students and us reviewing and going over uh, U.S. history and specifically manifest destiny, our manifest destiny unit. So um, if you have anything else to share, um, you can share it with me at another time, but this YouTube chat is not the forum for that. Okay. Uh, Ashley, were the California missions Christian or Catholic? And the answer is both, uh, because Christianity is, you know, today Christianity is a very broad tent that covers um, kind of two broad categories, Catholic and Protestant. Uh, the original Christian church was the Roman Catholic church uh, that goes, goes back. I'm not going to go through the entire history of <laughs> Catholicism or Christianity, um, but uh, all Catholics are Christians, but not all Christians are Catholic because you have various denominations of Christianity. So, um, so Ashley, to, uh, to address your question, uh, the California missions were Christian, but more specifically, they were Catholic. Uh, Jalen asks, can we do the California gold rush push and pull? Absolutely. Uh, so Jalen, let me go ahead and we'll start with the push factors first. So when we think about the California gold rush, who was participating primarily in the California gold rush, I would say similar to the mountain men, it was mostly younger men, late teens, early to mid twenties, maybe a little bit older. I think mostly young men unattached, no, um, probably unmarried and looking for, you know, they're, they're, they're not really finding economic opportunity where they are currently, whether they're coming from Massachusetts, New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, what they're doing is they're not finding what they need where they are. So I think the push factor is they, they don't have, they don't have economic opportunity where they are. They don't have adventure where they are, whatever the case may be. And so that pushes them out of their previous location and it's going to pull them to the California gold rush. And of course the pull of the California gold rush is the number one pull is of course should go without saying that pull is gold or actually I should do this. The pull is gold, right? Um, that's the number one pull of the California gold rush. But as we've talked about before, not everyone who made money in the California gold rush was making money off of gold. And actually 
Uh, I would say the majority of people who were making money in the California gold rush were not making it from gold. Instead, they were making it from supporting the people who were coming in for gold, right? So they were cooking meals for them, or they were doing their laundry, or they were selling them supplies. They were opening up, you know, general stores and selling shovels and pickaxes and uh, and blue jeans, right? Uh, Levi Strauss, we, uh, we've talked about this. Many classes had Levi Strauss as a topic of one of our presentations. And... Um, so Levi Strauss, who, by the way, did not invent blue jeans, but he did develop the process of rivets, those little metal. If you next time you you feel the the uh, the seam, the where the pockets attach on your blue jeans, many of them have these small metal rivets, and that's what makes the blue jeans sturdier. So you can store more stuff in your pockets, right, without the pockets ripping off. So the majority of people who made money on the gold rush were actually people selling to the miners as opposed to the gold miners themselves. So um, that's the California gold rush and the pull was the gold, but the pull could also be the money to be made off of the people looking for the gold. Okay. Um, and I think that's Jalen. I think I answered your question there. Nico says, do you have any idea how many questions there are going to be on the test? If so, how many for the multiple choice and the written portion? Uh, and so I would say I'm guessing probably between 20 and 30 multiple choice questions, somewhere in there, 20, 25, 30 multiple choice. Um, and then anywhere from, I want to say three or four, probably short answer questions. So I think that's the short answer. Um, I think hopefully that helps. All right. Um, Dylan says, Oregon country number four. Hello, Dylan, and welcome. Oregon country number four, who were the first Americans to build permanent homes? Those were Marcus and Narcissa Whitman. They were husband and wife, and they were both missionaries, Christian missionaries who wanted to go and convert the, the local Native Americans, the Cayuse Indians, to Christianity. Um, and so that's why they were there, was for the purpose of religious conversion. Okay. Uh, so Dylan, hopefully that answers your question. And Preston asks, could you go over the Gold Rush Missions Mormons stuff, please? Well, Preston, I've already gone over a lot of that stuff. But again, as I've recommended previously, I would say your best bet, since we have only 23 minutes left together, um, the best bet, and I'm going to, I've said it before, I'm going to say it again. There is a YouTube video right there. And if you watch that YouTube video, I go over in detail, everything that you need to know about the gold rush, the missions, the Mormons, and the women. Uh, and so I think it's it's good stuff. I will tell you, since we're already kind of talking about this particular topic, uh, I'm going to, I'll talk briefly, Preston, I will speak about questions 11 and 12. What challenges did pioneer women face? And um, how and why did women in the West seem to gain rights more quickly? This right here, this section right here, these together look like a really good short answer question. And so if you're looking, I'm just, I'm not going to give away all of that evidence, nor am I going to make a claim for you. But I will tell you that if you're looking for evidence, I think you're going to find it, first of all, in chapter nine, there was a section on pioneer women in chapter nine. And again, an even better section created by me, Mormons, missions, gold rush and women, or wait, yeah, yeah, Mormons, Missions, Gold Rush, and Women. It's a, just in a different order. So um, so again, I strongly encourage you, check out the reading. Just do the reading and or watch the YouTube video. It's all good stuff. Okay, uh, hopefully that helps. Neha, could you go over Gold Rush Missions? Oh, numbers 11 and 12. I, I just did, but again, because that's most likely going to be a short answer question, uh, I'm gonna encourage you to, I'm gonna just send you to the reading and to that YouTube video for more information. Uh, Jalen says gold rush three, why were Northerners opposed to the Mexican war? Oh, well, that's, I can answer that because of slavery, right? That's really a one word answer. Why were Northerners opposed to the Mexican war? Because they did not want Texas to become another slave state to then throw the balance of slave and free states out of order. So that's why it took so long. It took nine years for Texas to become a state. Um, and it then, um, Northerners were very much opposed to the Mexican war after the annexation of Texas, right? So there's really, you start to see in the 18, really in the 1840s, it had been building over time, but you really see it starting in the 1840s, the divide between the North and the South over issues related to slavery, related to adding slave territory to the United States, right? And, and you're going to see that build up more and more 1840s, and then in the 1850s, and then finally it's going to come to a head in the election of 1860 when Abraham Lincoln is elected president of the United States. And then the, the country will literally be torn apart over the issue of slavery. 
Uh, Abby says, can you do Texas number seven? Well, I'm sure going to try. Let me go back up to Texas. Texas number seven, what was their battle cry? Remember the Alamo. I can, uh, let me go ahead and put this in red ink. Remember the Alamo. Now I will tell you, uh, there was something else. There was in a slideshow that you might've seen attached to some agenda. There was some other battle cry and I honestly forget what that was. And I even created that slideshow, but um, that was, I don't, I don't, all all I can tell you is remember the Alamo. Uh, That was their battle cry for sure. Remember the Alamo. They also said, remember Goliad, which was a related battle where Americans were also uh, slaughtered by the Mexican army. Uh, Texans, I should say, Texan Americans were slaughtered by the Mexican army. Okay, uh, Joel says gold rush number one. I can sure try to do gold rush number one. Oh, who b- built the first Spanish mission in California? Let's go ahead and Joel, I will tell you that that was Father Junipero Serra. Junipero Serra, Father Serra. He was one of those Spanish priests uh, who was the first one there. He built uh, the mission San Diego de Alcala in San Diego, California. That was his very first one, built a few more. And then other Catholic priests, Spanish Catholic priests, uh, took over and started building the other uh, missions. Uh, the closest, the one closest to us, Mission San Fernando was not, that was built in, the, I think in the early 1800s, was not built by Father Sarah, it was built by someone else. Um, so that's the answer to that one there. Raiden says, are you going to give us back the map handout? Yes, I meant to hand it out to you yesterday, Raiden, in class, and I apologize. So anybody, for anybody, I've handed back some maps and then others I haven't. So um, I will definitely give you your map handout back. You just need to ask for it. Okay, Nico Gabriel, what do you think is the hardest question we could study on? Oh my goodness, what is the hardest question? Um, well, let's, you know what, Nico, you asked a really, really good question. Um, I think the ones that require the most thought are going to be the ones that are most likely to be a short answer question. So maybe we can take some time right now. Uh, I think number 10, I think this is probably a good candidate for a short answer question. I would say, as I've already mentioned previously, I think 11 and 12, probably a good candidate for a short answer question right there. Um, you know what else might be a good candidate for a short answer question? And I'm going to keep scrolling. I think this painting could also be a good candidate for a short answer question, right? You know, we, this was one of the very first things that we looked at in our units and there's my dog, uh, barking to get out. So, uh, I'm going to take just a moment and I'm going to go let my dog out. So give me just a moment. (laughs) I will be right back. That's what happens when you're live is you never know what's going to happen. And uh, when you have a dog, the dog's got to go. She's got to go. All right. uh, Getting back to the painting, I think, and again, this is, uh, I think that there could be a short answer question on this too. So I think if we're going all the way back, like four and a half weeks ago, four, four and a half weeks ago, uh, I think it's good to kind of talk once again about this painting. I think it's good to, and Nico, such a brilliant question. I'm glad you asked it. I think it's good to point out that the sun is rising here in the east and that it is still sort of like dark and mysterious in the west, right? I think it's good to point out that this is most likely New York City. If you recall, uh, I think good to point out that this, that the the flying lady, we've we've referred to her as many different terms, uh, and the angel or the the goddess, uh, Lady Columbia, uh, whatever, whatever her name is, that she is, that she has these telegraph wires, right? And the telegraph wires represent communication. Uh, They represent, if you recall the painting, the title of the painting is American Progress. So one of those short answer questions that you might just see, maybe it's going to ask something about how does this painting represent American progress? And Make your claim and then back up your claim with evidence. You'll recall that the book here that is in her hand says school book. You'll recall that there are multiple modes of transportation, right? We've got trains, we've got stagecoaches, we've got people on foot here. These look like farmers. We have people who are potentially golden going on the gold rush here. We've got a prairie schooner right there. We got what appears to be a Pony Express rider there. 
Um, so I think there's a lot of this, there's a lot going on in this painting. Uh, and so I think this painting could potentially be the topic of a short answer question. I think that was a great, great question. Uh, Nico Gabriel, I'm, I'm glad you, I'm glad you asked that. Okay. Nico Gabriel, if you think of any other uh, thought provoking questions, then throw them in the chat. Um, Nico says, thanks. And you're welcome, Nico. Nico Lazar. Uh, Emma says, can you do Texas number five, please? Well, I will sure try. Texas number five says, describe what happened at the Alamo. Okay. Well, uh, it, 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 short, short answer. And again, this, this all comes from uh, our study of the Alamo, right? We watched the movie, the Alamo. So, uh, you have Texans, they converge at the Alamo. The Alamo is a, has been for years, for generations, has served as a church, as a lookout, as a, as a army garrison. And now this is where the Texian army, right? The American Texans are gathering along with the Tejanos, the, the Mexican born uh, Texans who are also opposed to Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana. Uh, they are all kind of gathered together, as small a group as they are, they're gathered together to try to defend this outpost, this fort. But there's not a whole lot of them. The majority of the Texan army is with Sam Houston, and he is in a different place, not at the Alamo. And so they are stuck at the Alamo because of the tactic that we've learned. It's one of our vocabulary terms. They are stuck. They cannot leave. They cannot go anywhere because of this tactic right here. It's called siege. So Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana, Santa Ana has laid siege now to the Alamo. And so he has, and if you watched my vocab video, you'll, you'll know all of this. Santa Ana has surrounded the Alamo uh, and there's no way to escape. And Santa Ana has declared that these, that these Texans that are inside the Alamo, that they are pirates, right? They are pirates, they are traitors. And the, if you recall the flag that was flying death to traitors, he plans to kill all of them. So what happened at the Alamo? They just, they had to wait and wait. That's what happens in a siege. You can't leave, the people inside can't leave. And as long as the people outside, this was the Mexican army, as long as they're willing to wait, and wait and wait, then you just, it's a, it's a standoff. It is just a, it's just a matter of, it's a waiting game. And eventually on the 13th day, 12th or 13th day, that was when the Mexican army finally led their invasion of the Alamo. And ultimately all of the Texans at the Alamo were either killed in battle or they were executed afterwards. The final one who was executed was Davy Crockett. So that's what happened at the Alamo. But what also ended up happening as a result of the Battle of the Alamo was it enraged and motivated and unified, along with the Battle of Goliad, which you don't ever see in the movie, uh, the Texan army, the rest of the Texan army, the bigger Texan army, the one that was led by Sam Houston. And so it is that army, Sam Houston's Texas army, that is ultimately going to get their revenge, like I said, at the Battle of San Jacinto in 18 minutes. And that's where they're going to capture Santa Ana. They're going to capture Santa Ana's brother-in-law, General Cos, and uh, they're going to force the surrender of the Mexican army. And they're going to force Santa Ana to sign the document that gives Texas uh, its independence. So that, number five, was what happened at the Alamo and, frankly, in the movie, the Alamo. Okay. Um, I think that was, oh, Emma's, that was Emma's question. Emma, that was a good question. Neha says, could you go over Oregon number seven? Have I spoken yet about Oregon number seven? Oh, I did speak briefly, but I'll review it. Yeah. So which two countries jointly occupied the land by 1818? So Neha, by 1818, it was really down to just these two countries right here, Britain and the United States. Those were the two countries by 1818 that had occupied Oregon territory. They were the only ones who had any like troops in, in the area. They were the only ones who had any serious claim uh, to the land. And so Russia and Spain kind of backed off because they were they, they were just too far away. They, there was no way that they could support, you know, if... If somebody else wanted to make a claim, there was no way that they could back it up. They just didn't have the, the resources uh, nor, nor the commitment for that matter um, to, uh, to defend Oregon if they wanted to. Okay, Raiden asks, what are we going to need to know for the map questions and will what will we need to know when it comes with the primary sources? Um, so first of all, the map questions just 
I'm, I might ask you where stuff is. And when I ask you where stuff is, then on the map, if you recall from the practice, on the map, if I ask you, like, where was the Battle of the Alamo? Then you're going to put a red X where the Battle of the Alamo is. It, they're not trick questions, right? If I if I ask you, where did uh, you know where did the Mormon Trail start from? Well, that was Nauvoo, Illinois. So where did the Mormon Trail end? Right here, the Valley of the Great Salt Lake. Where was gold first discovered? I'm giving away all these potential questions here. Um, right there again, you just you, you know you mark it with a red X. So, uh, Raiden, Emma, you're welcome. Raiden, to answer your question, um, what are we going to need to know for the map questions? That's what you'll need to know. As long as you have been studying, I know this is this might be a little unsettling for some people, but as long as you have been learning the stuff and know what we're studying, then and again, if you need to, you'll always have the backup of Google as well, right? So, um, so again, these are these are things and places that I think you should already know. Um, but if you need that Google backup, then you'll have that as well in, in terms of the map questions. Um, and then what will we need to know when it comes to the primary sources? I think you will need to know what they all mean. Um, we, for sure, we went, you'll see right here. And now, of course, you hear my dog. She desperately wants to get back into the house. So at some point, I'll probably stand up and let her back in really quickly. Um, we started, we started the primary sources assignment. Uh, in our last class, and we got about halfway through, and then I said, we'll finish, you know, we'll finish in our next class. And so today you had the choice. One of the things that you could have done, I know there was a lot of things you could have done uh, yesterday or today in your independent work time. One of the things you could have done is you could have either finished going over, just reading the documents. And then if you're like, Mr. Polito, these documents are really, really challenging. Well, again, what you can do is, and what, what I would encourage you to do if those documents are giving you some trouble, we're gonna do a stop the screen share. Hello, hey, it's Mr. Polito. Um, let me just show you this here. I think this is what I want to share. Yep, it sure is. So if you go back again, I've shared so many resources with you. Um, and one of those resources that I'm gonna encourage you to go to is this YouTube playlist right here. And this YouTube playlist has so much good stuff. Again, part of the reason why I created this YouTube playlist is because there's just too much good stuff for me to share in one hour, uh, in a one hour session here in our YouTube live. So primary sources, this is in 18 minutes. You can go over at all of the primary sources. Now, I think in most classes, we already went over half of the document. So really, it's just a matter of starting it about six minutes in and within 12 minutes, you can get, if, you, if you're like, uh, I still don't quite understand President Polk's State of the Union message. Well, then watch this six minute clip and it's Mr. Ippolito explaining what he thinks is important. Oh, that poem, that was a tough poem. Well, watch this six minutes on the poem and you will get, you will get all the information that you need. Part of the reason I don't mention, you know, Vincent earlier asked, Mr. Ippolito, can you go over the whole thing? Uh, <laughs> you know, someone asks, Mr. Oblito, can you go over all the primary sources? What I'm really trying to do for you is I'm trying to, there's no way in an hour we can go over everything. Um, but what I'm hoping that I can do is, is point you in the right direction. So if you're feeling unsure about any one particular thing, if you're feeling unsure about the primary sources, the vocabulary, gold rush missions, Mormons and women, if you're feeling a little shaky about any of these things, then you know maybe you want to go back and review chapter the 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 book reading uh, one and two or three and four. Uh, so that's my that, that's that's my best advice for you there uh, is to you know just just go over what you need to go over. And since we have time, you know we have another seven minutes. Let's go over the primary source. Let's very briefly go over the primary sources. Specifically, we we went over we we all went over this one here the uh, the manifest destiny that John L. O'Sullivan. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. The Harper's Weekly Cartoon. Um, the, the I think the two questions that I asked were, how is power represented? So uh, in a couple of ways, first of all, Sam, this is Sam Houston here. He is taller than Santa Ana. He's taller than General Cos right there. Uh, Santa Ana and Cos both are handing over their swords, right? So that is a that is an act of submission. They're handing over their weapons. Speaking of weapons, Sam Houston right here. Look at this. 
man, he's wielding this really, really long rifle. Santa Ana's like, I got a big rifle. So, ha ha. Plus he has the sword. So that's another way of projecting power. Um, again, he's, he's, uh, he's shown as taller than the two Mexican generals here. And he's clad in buckskin, which is interesting because generally buckskin is how we associate. Um, we think of Davy Crockett wearing buckskin, um, not Sam Houston. And so interesting that uh, Sam Houston here is wearing buckskin. Somebody said he almost looks regal. He almost looks like a king. Uh, and I thought, well, that's really interesting uh, to, to think of it that way. So, uh, so I, think this is, I think this is a good cartoon just to kind of consider and think about uh, in case that might appear as one of your one of your questions. Um, and uh, let me then just in, in order, President Polk's State of the Union message, the two questions that I ask you to consider, first of all, this line right here, when labor in all branches of business has received a fairer or better reward. Again, so ironic that President Polk is saying, you know what? America is amazing. And you know, one of the things that's amazing about America is the fact that all of our laborers, all of our workers receive a fair and good reward. They are all well paid. Our laborers, they're just, they're doing great. Well, all of the laborers, except those who are forced laborers, right? Who are enslaved laborers. President Polk, pardon me, President Polk uh, owns enslaved people. He is an owner of other humans. And so, of course, when he's thinking of Americans, he's probably not considering those Americans who are in bondage, right? So this is kind of ironic that he mentions this. Um, also, you know, ironic, again, talking about irony, it has ever been our cherished policy to cultivate peace and goodwill with all nations. And this pet policy has been steadily pursued by me. I am a peaceful person. Oh, except for the fact that we're at war right now with Mexico, right? We are literally in the war, in the middle. How ironic that in the middle, right smack dab between 1846 and 1848 is the Mexican War. And President Polk is calling himself peaceful and saying America is peaceful when we are literally at war in the middle of a war. So the other question that I ask you to consider is where are the instances where President Polk is portraying America as wonderful and grand and fabulous and amazing? And when he's trying to portray Mexico as evil, as the bad guy, right? Finally, there's this poem here. And um, the best thing that I can do, the, the best way to do justice to this poem, because it's 757, there's no way I'm going to have a full discussion on this poem. Um, but I want you to examine, I want you to look at the way that poet James Russell Lowell, uh, who was writing this poem right as the Mexican War is beginning, the Mexican-American War, this author, this poet from Massachusetts, how he is building his case that the Mexican war is all about slavery. And let me just once again say this, if you have not yet watched at the very least, if you wanna understand this poem, please take a moment, click on primary sources, the Mexican war and get, like give yourself six minutes, literally six minutes. And Mr. Apolito does a pretty doggone good job of in six minutes breaking down a poem. So if you're looking for a better understanding of that poem, just devote six minutes of your life, watch that. And, uh, and it's gonna, yeah, it's, it, you're gonna, you're, you'll thank me for it. <laughs> you will thank me. It is, um, it's a good share. It, it is definitely a good share. Okay. Um, let's see. I'm just trying to catch up here. Um, Raiden says, last question, is the study guide for completion and free points? Oh, Raiden, that's a great question. The study guide, uh, as I mentioned previously in class, if you turn it into me and it is complete, then yes, it'll kind of be free points, but it's not extra credit. Let's just be clear. It's going to be an assignment that I put in Google Classroom and it will be worth probably 10 points. And if you turn it in, it's 10 out of 10, which is 100%, right? It's always great to get 100% A+. Plus on an assignment in Mr. Polito's class. But if you don't turn it in, it'll just be an infinite campus. It'll just be X for XQ. So it's not extra credits, but I can definitely, if your grade in my class is below 100%, then a 100% on any assignment is always going to improve your grade. Um, is it possible to pass with not a lot of studying? Oh, uh, that's Vincent. Uh, and I suppose if you have been paying attention a lot in class, then sure, yeah, it's definitely possible. The whole reason for studying is just like, just to kind of refresh your memory 
right? And then kind of focus your study on the stuff that is the most important. Um, so yeah, is it possible to pass with not a lot of studying? As long as you've been paying attention, um, doing a good job on your assignments, if you've been you know, keeping up with the, with the reading, the textbook reading and uh, other assignments, and you know, then, then in that case, you don't need to do as much studying. Um, Nico says, Thanksgiving, and sorry, thank you, and you're welcome. Jalen says, sorry, but could you do Gold Rush 7? Okay, well, let's see if I can in our time that we have remaining. Am I already sharing? Yes. So uh, let's go back here. And briefly, I will do Gold Rush 7. So Gold Rush 7, what challenges did the Mormons face? Uh, well, specifically, they were facing the challenge when they were back in their you know, homes of either New York or Ohio or uh, Illinois, they were being they were experiencing religious persecution, as I talked about previously. Uh, and so, and their leader, Joseph Smith, was murdered. So I would say that that's probably a challenge uh, when the people who are surrounding you who do not share your faith system, your, your religious practices, when they're like, hey, you people are weird and we don't understand or like you, then those would be big challenges. And then I think the challenges that they faced once they got to the end of the Mormon trail um, were they faced the challenges of having to build a life in the desert, right? Having to find water when it's really difficult to find water in the desert. So um, that's those are the challenges that the Mormons faced. But once again, I will remind everybody that for more information on Gold Rush Missions, Mormons and Women, there is a reading and there is a YouTube video that uh, will be very helpful for you. Uh, so Jalen, hope that was at least a point in the right direction. Nico says, what papers are allowed, videos and tools for the test and which ones do you recommend? Okay, uh, we're at 801, so I'll answer this fairly quickly. Um, well, I, I have said before, I will say it again, and I will uh, do a new share here just to just kind of reinforce this idea that the, the videos that I recommend the most, these are my top three right here, right? Vocabulary. Uh, oh, I did not mean to click on that, but I did want to see, oh, so vocabulary, uh, primary sources, gold rush missions, Mormons and women. Those are the videos that I recommend the most. If you're going to, you know, if you're, if you're going to watch three videos, watch these three, if you're going to only going to watch two, watch, well, two of these three, <laughs> um, and then papers are allowed. Any papers are allowed. I think this is open note, open book, open Google, open YouTube, open everything. So it's really a matter of what it comes down to is, do you have your notes organized? Do you know where everything is? Um, if, you, if you have a good grasp on things and you've studied, the test will be easier for you. If you did not do much studying at all, then you're going to spend an hour and a half scrambling to try to find all of these resources. And the same rules apply as last time. Once you leave the classroom, that's it. You're done. Uh, this is a this is an exam that you should be able to finish in about 40, 45 minutes or so, uh, and probably less time. But if you're trying to Google every single answer, it's easily going to take you an hour and a half. So um, it's going to be similar in length to the quarter two final exam, right? Um, there was a previous exam where it was ginormous and you know a lot of students were taking beyond an hour and a half and it was kind of ridiculous. It will be similar in length to the quarter two exam that was, I think I called it the quarter two quiz, where it was shorter, more manageable. Um, I think some students were finishing in like 25, 30 minutes. Most students were finishing by an hour. I think by the time we hit an hour and a half, there was maybe like one or two students still working. But I think those one or two students who were still working are either working, they're kind of working very, very slowly, or they're just trying to Google everything. If you're trying to Google every answer, you will struggle. Um, oh, Abraham. Yes. Hey, good to see you. Welcome back. Uh, and Alex, yes. Neha will excuse decrease our grades. No. Um, if you don't turn in the study guide, then X for excuse, it just means it does not impact your grade at all. And then are you allowed to use the textbook? Yeah, sure. Go ahead and use the textbook. That's fine. It's open book, open note, open Google, open YouTube, open everything, but you just have to finish it before you leave my class. Okay. Well, uh, I think that that is all that I can say. Um, however, there's still plenty of more great content, uh, great stuff to review. And so, like I said, I would encourage you, I've really, I've worked really, really hard on this unit more than any other to give you so much material that you can prepare from and that you can study from. Um, so I think you could go into this exam more prepared than you've ever been 
uh, it's just just going to take you a little bit of time uh, and a little bit of preparedness. And um, and so, but I I believe in you. I have faith in you, and I think you're going to do great. And if you are have been watching this for the last hour and four minutes, then already you're on the right track to doing a great job on the exam uh, for Manifest Destiny. Okay, at this point, this is when I am going to wave goodbye to you. Thank you so much for being here, especially five minutes after our one hour time period has elapsed. So thank you and good luck to you. And I'll look forward to seeing you in our next class in our classroom. Thanks so much. Have a great evening uh, or whatever time you're watching this. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye-bye everyone.